All right, everyone, welcome back to the Be Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Murphy. I reached out last week and asked everyone who follows me any questions that you wanted to have answered on the podcast or any topics that you wanted to have. So we took pretty much everyone that was serious and Hurley has them. I'm going to have him ask the questions and I'm going to go Andy Stump style on this one, which he does for, I think it was, he called it Full Auto Friday. Um, but he essentially allowed himself five minutes to answer a question because as we know, I like to talk. So Hurley's going to keep me accountable. He'll ask me the question and we're going to set a five minute time limit to give you um, the best answer that I can. If I don't know much about it, we'll just kind of, I may direct you to another source, uh, but I'm super passionate. I'm super fired up. Training has been awesome. Work has been awesome. Things with Big Night Fitness are awesome. The people that we get to work with and instructors are great. I'm fired up. So let's answer some questions. All right, let's go. First question, any tips for not losing steam on long-term goals? So any tips on not losing steam on long-term goals? Man, there's so many different factors that could derail someone and also probably so many different answers that could that could keep someone hanging on. Um, one of the things for me that really, really helps, and this might not be the optimal answer, but it's something that directly relates to my motivation is having um, an accountability buddy, is committing to do the fitness things or committing to the goal that you want to achieve with someone else because then there's someone else to hold you accountable. Because if you want to be really true to your word, it's, it's highlighted and elevated when the word is to someone else rather than when it's just you. And this may not be applicable. Maybe I, I could maybe give you some better insight on the solo motivation after this. But I know that you know, I train at 6 a.m. And I try not to coach at 6 a.m. It's like, hey, I'm training at 6 a.m. If you want to come in here and throw down with me, awesome. I have the keys to the gym. I have the keys to both gyms that I train at. So if I don't show up, the people that are showing up there are not going to train. And since starting back training every day in the morning, my motivation levels are skyrocketed through the roof. Like I'm so excited to train and continue to push these health markers towards fit and to continue to get fitter and look fitter and feel better and, and be inspirational for others. But it, it counts because that person knows that I'm going to train. Um, I actually met this morning with a guy, Flo. He works for Ginkgo Bioworks and just at a level of intelligence where I'm just excited he wants to have a conversation with me but is so smart and talks about, you know, this, this new level of creation at a molecular level of, of trial and error and clinical trials of, of things. It's so cool. Yet his most inspiring and most motivated that he was, uh, he told me this today, and which is really cool, is that it involves Austin Maliola, one of my best friends, one of my mentors, <clears throat> and the story that he never told, of course. But they were, we, were, we were trying out this new... All right, you have like each person has a topic. Each one of our coaches has a category that they're going to focus on and you can kind of join or put yourself in one of each bucket. Austin's was training at 5 a.m. Mine was, um, I believe it was a diet. It might have been an intermittent fasting piece. Um, Kevin O'Connell, one of our coaches, had a like a feet on the floor where you have a certain amount of time and that window gets shorter and shorter between when your alarm goes off and when you have to put your feet on the floor you know, by standing up and waking up really just like simple stuff, but really cool. And flow was like the most motivated I've ever been. I was writing my own program. Austin would kind of tweak it. But at 6am, Austin messaged flow every single day for that month. How was the workout? And knowing that that was coming when flow is waking up at 5am to train, it was like, I can't not respond to that. And I also want to have an answer. I can't just make something up. So it was really cool about having that accountability, however you can have it, whether it's a text message, whether it's even writing it down. If it's just you, writing down before you go to bed, this is my intention for tomorrow morning. This is how I'm going to achieve it. It's like that, you know, you're, you're making that promise to yourself. But as opposed to just that thought process of I'd like to wake up early, now you're writing it down or having someone else to hold you accountable is a way that I've found very, very beneficial. Lots of ways to do it but that's just maybe one that could help. Nice. All right, next question. How do you ramp up regularly or regularity slash intensity of workouts without getting hurt? Mm. The intensity, uh, <clears throat> intensity versus technique. 
uh, discussion. Um, as opposed to giving the entire technique versus intensity lecture from the CrossFit Level 1 seminar, here's what I've found because I don't get a chance to train um, everyone as frequently as I would like. So for instance, if I'm training someone and we only get three workouts together over the span of a weekend, I'd really like them to garner some adaptation and some fitness goals that they would like, but three days is very, very difficult. So if I want to dose them up with intensity, I know that it can't have as much technical complexity in the workout. So there's not as much, there's not as much, there's a lot more room for error with higher complexity movements than there is with something that's simpler that you can amp the intensity up. I'm kind of nuking this right now. Let me simplify it. In order to increase your intensity, the higher the intensity or the higher the weight is, so either the weight or the speed, the increased demand is for mechanics. So if you move really, really well, and you can do that very consistently, then we can start to add the intensity towards those movements. Let's talk about higher complexity movements like, for instance, a squat snatch, grabbing a barbell from the floor or an object from the floor in one motion, pulling it up and receiving it in the bottom of a squat. A lot of flexibility, a lot of accuracy, agility, balance, and coordination that it takes to do that well. If you don't do that well or that with mechanics or with consistency, we shouldn't be dosing that with intensity. However, you can get someone on a rower, and even if they're not the best rower, we're talking about a concept to erg, even if they're not the best rower in the world, the, the technical complexity of it could be high, but the risk for injury is, is really, really low. So even if they're just giving like one focus on mechanics to get a little bit better at what they're doing rowing, you can really dose the intensity up on something like that. Similar with running, similar with burpees, similar with a lot more body weight movements, but the more you add weight and the more you add speed to the movement, the increased demand for mechanics is and the increased risk of injury. So just think about that as far as ramping up intensity where some days it may just be working on your overhead squat at a relatively low intensity because that's what the mechanics you know, that's with the mechanics that you have at that point in time. Maybe even decreasing it where if the, wor the workout is, you know, 100 overhead squats with 135 pounds, and you're like, well, I, I can't do that well. I'm not super comfortable with the overhead squat. Kind of a couple of options. You can attack the workout with significantly less weight and slower movement to get better at the overhead squat. You can also, and it's not the worst thing in the world, be like, hey, I'm not great at overhead squat, but I can back squat pretty dang well. So I'm going to load 135 on the back squat where my mechanics are sound and I'm going to rip through the 100 back squats. <clears throat> That's dosing up the intensity appropriately for what you are capable of the movements, right? What your overall capability is. Maybe the 135 overhead squat is really close to your max, but it's not for the back squat. So you have a little bit more room for error there. So dosing up the intensity with appropriate movements, but don't forget about the skill movements. That's where I think people pigeonhole themselves in the, in the Barry's boot camps and a lot of the other training for like the Orange Theory is that if they're not optimal at one lift, they'll kind of scale it down where you can get high intensity, but we're never practicing that. So we're never going to get better at that. Like the breadth of the adaptation correlates to the breadth of the stimulus. If you're not consistently practicing something, you're not going to get better at it. So continue to practice, but also if you want to ramp up the intensity because we love the results that come from intensity, then do it with appropriate movements. Cool. All right. Type one versus type two muscle fibers and importance of training both. Okay. Now we're getting into um, a little more specialty or esoteric, if you will, realm. <coughs> when we talk about... Um, type one or type two muscle fibers, it's, in, it's really specifically talking about slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers, which may be a term that um, more, the broader audience will understand. Think about the slow twitch as kind of our bigger moving muscle fibers and our fast twitch as more of like the smaller but faster moving muscle fibers. And then if I can kind of categorize that in three is think slow twitch and then 2A fibers, which are more like the moderate, and then our fast switch muscle fibers. So we kind of have three across the board. The importance of training all of them is because there's a series of adaptation that can happen from training all of them. 
you know, the long, slow distance type for muscle fibers or even very, very slow, heavy lifts that recruit more of the muscle fibers can benefit training in that realm. And similarly, with our fast twitch muscle fibers, you have to train maybe some of those shorter, faster events or more of like sprinting or, or really anything that is moving in, in a fast pace for your fast twitch muscle fibers will get you better and more adaptation at the fast twitch. <coughs> However, why I think a lot of gain happens from the 2A muscle fibers is because they have that carryover into you know, both of our metabolic pathways. We have our phosphagen pathway, which is our like, you know, that's our, you know, like max power output lasts about 10 seconds. Our glycolytic pathway, which is about two minutes, peaks at about one minute. And then the oxidative pathway, which is more of our aerobic pathway. And, but by training in the middle, you have adaptation in both. So it is important if you want to be well-rounded to train each one of the muscle fibers, slow twitch, 2A, fast twitch. And granted, it's, it's a lot more complex than this. But for, the, for simply understanding, think about the specialist in someone who only trains really, really fast twitch muscle fibers, <clears throat> probably doesn't have adaptation or, or immense amount of capacity with slow twitch. Similarly, people who only train in slow twitch or people who only train in, that, in, in this pathway probably are going to struggle with any fast twitch. So it's, <clears throat> you know, the ability to do a heavy bench press. However, we can't rock out a bunch of push-ups really, really fast, right? Like, even though it's the same muscle group, there's different types of muscle fibers. And I think if you want more on this, I've worked a lot with um, Chris Hinshaw with aerobic capacity on how to train different muscle fiber types in the same movement to gain a lot of capacity. And I've actually developed a pull-up program that really focuses on each kind of group, each of those three groups of muscle fibers to access the most amount of strength. So I think we want as much as we can in all of them. A lot of time we train in the 2A because it has carryover to both, but think very similar to what I said before, Whatever you're not training is where you're going to have weaknesses. So the importance is to be well-rounded, is, is to train all three of those things. An example with the slow twitch, moderate, and then fast twitch muscle fibers for the pull-up program is I've had a lot of athletes do eccentric pull-ups. So, so stand or jump your chin over the bar, and then as slow as you can, hold that pull-up position supporting your own body weight or perhaps using a band if you're not strong enough. Even like a 10, 15-second descent, come back down, maybe do two of those. And then from there, you can hop in the band and do as many strict pull-ups at the band or just regular strict pull-ups as possible, now focusing on the actual contraction rather than just the eccentric contraction, the elongating phase of the pull-up, working more of the 2A, and then finishing off with getting a, a PVC pipe, put it around the band on the bar. And now I'm going through the same motion, but I'm pulling down really, really fast. I'm driving my elbows down fast, back and forth, achieving the lockout and doing that as many times as I can in 30 seconds is breaking down each group of muscle fibers that is all going to incorporate more strength in the pull-up. And I've found by training in that way, I have had a, a quicker and more efficient capacity gain in the pull-up than by doing any other program that just focuses on one specific muscle fiber group. What are the pros and cons of creatine and how to safely, safely properly and effectively use it? <clears throat> Uh, I love, I love this question because I love creatine. And if you listen to the podcast episode that we had, uh, Eva Claire Sinkowski on last week, she spoke about creatine as really being the most studied supplement and really being one of the only supplements that is actually scientifically proven to help with recovery and help with performance gains, especially in the phosphocreatine uh, pathway, energy pathway, which I referenced in the, in the previous question. There's not a lot that I have read or researched that is the negative or downside of creatine. It's something that your body naturally produces. And it's something that you can naturally get in foods and by adding it in as a supplement. And I, I believe it's like 95% of it is stored in your muscles, um, <clears throat> some in your brain and some in for males in the uh, testes. But what it does, it essentially allows the cell 
to expand and take on more water, which can help with strength, can help with recovery, helps with a lot of different things. And then there's that negative, like, oh, you're going to gain a bunch of water weight. Like, that really depends on genetics and also what you're consuming with the creatine. Um, so if your body naturally produces about two grams, and we're just generalizing here, and you, I mean, at a normal diet, you, maybe you consume two grams, two and a half grams, let's say, and, and creatine is, is mainly found mostly in, in meats, um, some in, you know, in vegetables, just much, much lower amounts. So with like a red meat, you're going to find a lot more creatine than you will in a piece of broccoli. Uh, so maybe you don't need to supplement it if you're eating a lot of that. But what I have found and what I have read is that almost matching what your body is naturally consuming and, and creating in creatine with the supplementation, usually about five grams will do it for you. Um, you can spread that out throughout the process of a day, um, two and a half grams in the morning, two and a half at night, five grams in the morning, however you want to break it down. What I have found is that I find creatine works the best for me if I have, if I take it consistently at the same time. So rather than it being, oh, I take it directly after a workout or I take it before a workout, because it is stored in your cells, which is stored in your muscle cells, I find that if I take it at the same time every morning, my body kind of knows exactly what's going to happen. I find them, I've found the most consistency that way. That's just me. That's just my preference as a, you know, as a high school diploma holder, um, <clears throat> but you know, with a lot of experience um, using it. I also tend to cycle off of it, maybe go a month on, a couple weeks off. I've gone two months on, one month off. The only reason that is that if something that your body naturally creates, if you are consuming that from an outside source, it may not trigger as much stimulation to create as much. Um, could be wrong on that, but that makes sense to me. Um, and, and positive benefits from it, why a lot of like powerlifters or bodybuilders take it is we talk about the phosphocreatine energy pathway, the phosphagen energy pathway. It is an anaerobic energy pathway. It means that it creates ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the um, molecule that allows our body to do work for our muscles to contract. So it is responsible for 100% of your power output, but only lasts about 10 seconds. And then the phosphocreatine is depleted, and then it has to you know, restore in the muscles in order for you to do that again, which is why you can't do your one rep max for 500 reps. You're utilizing all of the energy from that pathway before it transfers, or now more the glycolytic is adding a little bit more fire or a little bit more fuel to the fire than your phosphagen pathway. What creatine can do is being utilized in your cells and with the expansion of the cell is maybe increase what that 100% power is or give you a little bit more longevity. Um, so let's say, again, and this is just in layman's terms, like it's say if you have, you know, 10 second is your max for the, for the phosphocreatine pathway. Maybe if you're adding in creatine as a supplement, it goes for 11 seconds. And there are a lot of percentages, and like EC said, percentages that are above 5% of an increase. You know, as minimal increases could be from a lot of different factors, but there's a few studies that I've read that has some pretty, some pretty beneficial um, increases in strength in um, in really that phosphagen or phosphocreatine pathway. So I'd recommend it if your goal is to get stronger, if your goal is to get fitter. It's also like everyone, everybody is different. Try it out, see how you like it. I've always found that the better the creatine tastes, the probably more stuff that's added in it. I'm currently, I have no affiliation or relation with this brand at all, but there's a brand called Beyond Raw. And uh, it's the worst tasting creatine I've ever had in my life. It tastes like, like if you've ever thrown up all night and then when you don't have any throw up left, I know I have my five minute window, it tastes like bile. Like you have that, bile. that's what it tastes like. However, I've also found it to be the most effective. So sorry if that derails you from getting it or if you try to get that supplement, <clears throat> that's what I'm taking. And, um, and I do see the strength gains when I am consistently including it in my diet. Okay. Fasted <coughs> versus fueled workouts. Fasted versus fueled workouts. Another topic that's kind of like the, you know, difference between slow twitch and fast twitch. There are a lot of benefits from a lot of people a lot smarter than me that can talk about with fasted training versus essentially fueled training. 
um, you know, the creation of ATP or like utilizing ATP also works with, you know, how much glucose is in your blood and how much glucose is in your blood depends on how much insulin is released, how much insulin is released depends on what your stores look like or how much glucose is in your blood. So either glucose used immediately as ATP or adenosine triphosphate stored in the muscles and liver as glycogen. I'm sure we've all heard like, oh, my glycogen is depleted. And then if those stores are full, then it moves to adipose tissue, which is fat. So that's where energy is stored. And then counter-regulatory to insulin is glucagon. When levels of fasting or low glucose, low blood sugar, um, your pancreas releases glucagon, which essentially utilizes the stored energy from those sources to elevate the blood sugar back up. Why I am a proponent of fasting and why I like fasted workouts is because I think a lot of people, their goal is to lose body fat. And if your goal is to lose body fat, what's going to happen naturally if you are training in a fasted state is that your body needs to become more proficient at using stored energy to re-elevate your blood sugar. <clears throat> How we can break this down if you've ever felt this before is if you train fasted and you're like, wow, I'm really hungry. And you train, and you may be, you know, like, oh, I feel like weak after the workout or you know, I'm lightheaded or I feel super hungry. And then all of a sudden you start feeling better. You know, there, there was no caloric intake in there to make any changes. But what is happening is that that glucagon is being released because of the low points of blood sugar. And since there's periods of fasting where you're not having a lot of glucose in, you're signaling to your body to use stored energy. So if you have stored energy in adipose tissue, which is body fat, that is how your body is utilizing your body fat to elevate your blood sugar back up. Again, this is just a broad brush, simple overview of it. But why I like fasted cardio is because it can increase your body's ability to use stored energy um, to elevate your blood sugar. So you can, it is very beneficial for losing uh, body fat or for utilizing body fat. Um, however, there are going to be performance differences when you are, you are fueled for a workout and your glycogen stores are, are completely full, or you have elevated levels of glucose. I actually read recently a study of mid-workout glucose intake being the most beneficial thing for your muscles and for recovery and for energy and all of this stuff. And it's like, good, read, read those articles, try it out, see if you can gain the benefits from it. However, I'm not going to say, hey, do this one or do this one. There are known benefits to both of them. So why don't we try doing both? Let me try adding both of those things in. Fuel yourself, then do a workout. Track your progress. Do fasted workouts. See how you feel. What I know is if I'm fasted, I grab a barbell, don't feel quite as strong. However, cardiorespiratory endurance, I feel like I can go a little bit longer. That's just me from you know, 16 years of clinical trials and weighing, measuring food to know what my body is capable of, depending on what I'm putting into it. With fueled workouts, there are times when directly after I eat if from a period of fasting or just from low glucose, there's a period right after I eat where I feel like my power bar is like one of those Mortal Kombat characters. It's just like, whoop, like right up to the front. And I'm like, let's go. I grab a barbell. I'm like, I'm going to live forever. We're going to lift all the weight in the world. So there's probably benefits from both. I would say there are definitely benefits from both. And I don't think you need to be caught in the, in the trap of oh, you have to do one or the other. I would lean towards performance for fueled training and fat loss towards fasted training. Okay. How does alcohol affect the gains? How does alcohol affect the gains? Um, I believe my friend Nicole sent this one, right? Mm -hmm. Nicole Chabra. One of my favorite people. She's a beauty. Um, there are probably a hundred different podcasts from people way smarter than me, way more knowledgeable on the topic that can break down everything that's happening, happening when you consume alcohol via training, via sleep, via headspace, via everything else. 
like, let's just get this out there. There are no performance gains that happen from drinking alcohol. There is nothing. I'm also not going to say, hey, don't ever drink alcohol, everyone, because you're going to be healthier for it. Like I get, and again, especially coming from me, some of you guys are like, Connor, I've seen you out drinking before. Like, you know, and, and I, I get that. But when it comes to training and gains and achieving your goals with fitness, there's, there's nothing that it's going to benefit. And, you know, listen to the Huberman podcast on alcohol. And as you're sitting there waiting for it to be like, oh, here's, you know, a couple bugaboos here, but here's where it's really going to pay off. It's like, no, it doesn't. And, and it's a, it's a sensitive topic for me because drinking alcohol is something I've done, you know, since I was, you know, in high school. And it's something I've done where I can party and you're known as the party guy. And I drink to celebrate certain things or go out and have fun and, and I've enjoyed it. And so I've never been like, Hey, we shouldn't drink. It's like, you should be able to control it. However, I think that a lot of people struggle with it. And, and I think it's used as an excuse way too frequently. And, and I think it's the, the, I think it is the causal mechanism of a lot of people's problems, not a correlate. I think it is causal. And here's why I'm going to say that. I think as a society, drinking alcohol is widely accepted and being sober for a lot of people means you have a problem um, or you had a problem or you can't control it. And, and I think that's, it's now coming into perspective for me as someone who I'm not saying no one should drink. I'm not saying I'm never going to drink again either, but I'm also saying that I've yet to meet one person client or not that has stopped drinking because they didn't like the effects of it and the quality of their life decreased. Not one person have I ever met that I've had that happen with. No, what happens is when you stop drinking and you get over the, you know, the social anxiety of people being like, oh, you're not drinking. Yet you see the productivity in your life. Waking up is, is easier. You feel better. Your workouts are better. You achieve the fitness goals that you're looking for. You realize that the friendships that you had that revolved around alcohol may not have been those that great of friendships. They also could be when people support you if you choose not to drink. But it fucking blows my mind how it is just so taboo for someone to stop drinking. And like Hurley and I were talking about this before and like I, I start to get heated because I've seen it destroy people's fucking lives and the last thing they're willing to do is stop drinking. There's positive benefits from it if you go out and you have a good time and you're celebrating and you're enjoying yourself. I've been, I, I've done it a, a fucking million times. Like I'm there with you on it. But if you have a goal, if you want to be better at work, if you want to, you know, lose fat, if you're not happy with where you are from performing, stop fucking drinking alcohol. That is the problem. That is your problem. Sure, there's some other stuff that happens with it. But why do people have this attachment where it's like, oh no, I can't give this up. It's like, hey, here's, here are my, here's my goal. This is what I want to do, but I'm not willing to give up alcohol. It's like, why? Why does this thing have such a chokehold on you that you're so afraid to give it up? Put it like this. If someone, if one of your friends was in a toxic relationship and their significant other was just negative and every time they hung out with them, it was like these highs and then super lows. They're in an abusive relationship. They feel bad about themselves. They're not getting to where they want to be. Every morning that they woke up after staying at their significant other's house, they were like, I don't know why I keep doing this. You're going to be like, you need to fucking get out of that because it's unhealthy for you. And I hate to see this person have this control over you that's negatively affecting you. Yet there's something so fucking clear that doesn't have a personality that is you, your overconsumption of alcohol when it is negatively affecting your life that people are so afraid to get rid of it. And it's, a, and it's frustrating because you've seen the worst of it. I don't have to talk about my own personal experiences for you to feel bad for me. Every single person, however many there are, listening to this knows someone that has an issue with it or it's created massive issues in their life. Some people can't handle it. Some people need to be able to wean off of it. Here's my challenge for you. 
If you're sitting here listening to this being like, well, I'm not at where I am uh, with work, with my relationships, with, with, my, with my fitness, any of these things, stop drinking for three months. If that thought in your head is like, oh no, I can't do that, alcohol has a chokehold on you. Your quality of life could be better if you got a hold of the things that you truly cared about and you were able to leave it behind. That doesn't mean that you have to give it up all the time. I've had great friends have that have given up alcohol for years and then able to slowly implement it in and they're having a great time. They're not waking up the following day being like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? What did I do last night? Now my relationships are suffering. It can be something that can be socially fun. But if you're struggling with it and you're like, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to go out and not drink with my friends? Yes. And if your friends give you shit about it, you have shitty friends. Hey, I'm really trying to improve the quality of my life and alcohol is really affecting that. I don't, there's like police sirens going off right now. I'm just like on an absolute rant. I'm really trying to improve the quality of my life and alcohol is really affecting it negatively. And people are like, oh, you're no fun, but you can't handle it. Fuck those people because they need you to do it. So it, it, it okays them to do it. You're going to find out who your friends really are, who really cares about you. It's the people that are like, hey, maybe you don't need to do this. I'm here to support you. Someone says, hey, I'm really struggling with alcohol. I'm going to stop doing it for three months because some idiot on a podcast said that it might benefit my life. True friends might be the ones that go, fuck it. I'll do it with you. Maybe if they're not struggling with it at all. But it has a fucking chokehold on so many people, yet it's the last thing that anyone's willing to give up. If you're happy, if you're listening to this, you're like, I'm super happy. My life is where I want it to be. I have my fitness goals. I go out and drink casually and maybe over consuming it. That's an okay thing as well. What I'm referencing to the people that it's not okay. And that I'm here to tell you it's okay to not drink. There are three people that I've worked with in the fitness industry that are, that are famous musicians that have given up alcohol for now almost one over a year and now almost uh, almost a year for the other two. Let me tell you one negative thing they've said about not drinking. That's it. Every single one of them. I don't feel the social pressures to do it anymore. I'm so confident in who I am as a person. I don't need to hide behind this to have conversations. I used to have to drink because it was easier to DJ. I used to drink and party because that was the lifestyle of a pop star. No, you take a step back from it and some people might be like, hey, I can drink casually. I know a couple of world famous musicians that, that will have some of these drinks, but it doesn't have that control over them to think that they have to do it for someone else or to be someone. I'm more creative. It's helping my career. My relationships are better. I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. I'm a better boyfriend. I'm a better fiance. Yet to hear the bad side of it. I know I'm probably way over the five minutes on the alcohol piece there. Um, I'm just really passionate about it because I care. And you can call it selfish and be like, oh, Connor's just trying to get clickbait here for talking about this. But no, I really care. And I've seen it affect my family's lives, my friends' lives, my life. There's a reason why, you know, this person that is telling you that drinking isn't, isn't you know, the end all be all and that it's okay to give it up for a little bit because I have the same struggles because I've been at the point where I've drank for three, four, five days in a row and I wake up and I'm behind on my work. There's meetings that I miss. There's emails that have come through that I didn't respond to. There's stuff that I'm not as squared away for. There's training sessions where I could give more to certain people. And I'm like, I don't like this feeling. I'm going to stop doing it. And I'll stop doing it for months. And there's not been one time where it's been like, oh, you know what? That was an idea. I wish I was drinking all of these nights. I wish I had gone out. And I have the support of close friends. And I have that, that intake of my work being better and more squared away when I'm not doing that. And then there's times where I'm able to go out and have a couple of drinks and I have a good time and I wake up the next day and I know exactly everything is planned out. That was a blast. That was fun. I don't have anxiety about what's going to happen next or what I did the previous night. I had a great time. But as soon as I feel I start to get that chokehold on me, <clears throat> like I'm waking up and I'm like, oh, I don't want to drink. Yet every night before I go to bed, I have that feeling that I want to, I want to go out. I want to go to Rosa Lines, have a couple beers, check, catch, in with, catch up with everyone. If I were to go there 
and say, hey guys, I'm not drinking tonight, just going sober for a little bit, I'm not going to get shit from anyone. Why? Because those guys have probably seen, those guys and girls have probably seen the same thing. There's a lot more people that are struggling with it. <clears throat> so maybe you taking that first step to be something that improves the quality of life for other people. Take the challenge. Fucking call me out on it. Go sober for three months and tell me that your life didn't change for the better. I'll wait. I'm going to hold my breath, but I'll wait. Oh, man. Sorry, guys. I've... Sorry, I don't even know. I kind of blacked out there. I don't even know what I was saying. Um, and if you want to, if you're struggling with it, reach out to me. I'll go sober as long as you want to with you. I want to cut it out for a month, two months, a week. You need someone to talk to, need book recommendations, need things to do. What am I going to do if I don't go out on a Saturday night? I'll find some stuff for you. It doesn't all have to revolve around drinking or partying. I don't want to be like the fun sponge either. You could pull up a lot of videos of me with a lot of alcohol in my system looking like I'm having a really good time, and I am. But if it's not getting me to where I want, I'm going to cut it out, and I'm not going to have it. And I encourage you to do the same thing. I don't think I'm going to take any more questions after that. I think I like really, really went hard, and everyone's going to be like, I can't be like, oh, by the way, here's <laughs> some, some other things that are going on. Um, I appreciate everyone who's, who's listening into this. Know that passion comes from care. And it comes from personal experiences. It comes from anecdotal stories. It comes from, um, you know, history of substance abuse from my family, my friends, myself. Uh, anyways, that's all I got. I'll sign off. Um, you guys know how to follow us uh, at Big Night Fitness on Instagram. Um, if you're listening to this on YouTube and you want to leave a comment uh, to have a discussion, please do. Welcome all things, um, good, bad, and ugly, just as long as it's not vulgar. Um, we'll read it and respond. And then if you're struggling with this, reach out for help. I'm not a counselor. I can probably push you in the right direction for a lot of different people. But uh, take control of your life. Some of you might do the best thing you've ever done. Thanks.